All right, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. So today we are going to do, the two parts are going to be, the first one is I'm going to give a talk right now, and then after we're going to do question and answer. I'm sure many of us see many different things that take part in the liturgy. I think it's a good time for us to ask questions, and hopefully, hopefully the fathers will be able to, to answer some of those questions. Today, if you have Bibles in front of you or on your phones, if you can open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 from verse 13. Just so you can understand the context of this reading, this is... After Christ has res resurrected, the two disciples were on the road to MOS, and they were going, and they were speaking with one another, and Christ met them on the road and began to travel with them. So we're just going to read all the way from Luke chapter 24, verse 13, all the way to verse 36 of In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God, amen. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? And the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things had happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then they drew to the village where they were going. and He indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Verse 36, And now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. In this passage, which you are going to discover, for those that are just walking in, we're opening open up to Luke chapter 24. You are going to discover the mystery of the liturgy in this passage. And you might be able to identify or spot out one or two parts, but I'm going to show you how the whole passage is what we practice in the liturgy. And I always say, that the, not I always say, but I always say what the fathers say, that, is that the liturgy is an exchange of life. 
And we're going to see that, and you're going to understand what that means that one is exchanging his life when he enters into the liturgy. If you go back to the beginning where we started, we're going to take it verse by verse. It's important you understand that we, in the Coptic Church, in the school of Alexandria, we don't just look at Scripture at face value, but we look what's past it, what's behind it, what's talking about things that are beyond just the words of the page. We have to go deeper, dive into the words, and begin to discern what is it that we can practice and live in the words. What's the context? You have the disciples. They've been following Christ for two or three years. They've been walking with Him, watching Him do miracles. They saw Him, or they heard that He was crucified. They know He was buried. And now they're leaving Jerusalem. And it's important for you guys to understand why they're leaving Jerusalem. What does Jerusalem always represent? Two things. We say it in the liturgy. Heaven and the heart. But in this point, we're talking about heaven. What are they doing after they've been following Christ? Christ is crucified. What are they doing? They're leaving Jerusalem. They're leaving Jerusalem. What's meant for us to understand is that in their lack of understanding, when they saw that Christ, or they felt like Christ did not fulfill what they were hoping He was going to fulfill, they decided they were going to leave the way of heaven. They were leaving Jerusalem and going into the world to live like the world. And so you're going to see that they're depressed and Christ kind of, he, he zones in on the fact that they're depressed and he says, why are you sad? They're walking, they're down. And even when Christ says, you're going to see it in verse 17. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have that you have with one another as you walk and are sad. And they say, are you the only person in Jerusalem that has no idea what happened? Where have you been? And this is exactly, this is exactly what happens in the liturgy. People, when they enter into the liturgy, they walk into the church and they have not been able to discern God's presence. They are still not able to discern that God is in their midst. And what we do is we talk to one another. The priest says, peace be with you. And you respond back and say, with your spirit, lift up your hearts. They are with the Lord. And throughout the whole liturgy, we're going back and forth and we're speaking to one another. The priest says, greet one another with a holy kiss. We greet one another. It's this conversation going back with one another. But what happens is, you are in the church, you are in the liturgy, and for most of us, you walk in, and you always have people ask, at what part in the liturgy does Christ come? One thing you have to understand is that the first thing is that because liturgy is out of time, it's outside of time, Christ himself cannot be limited to time. And because when we enter into liturgy, we leave time because Christ is not restrained by time because he is eternal and he is infinite and he is incomprehensible. There is no certain time in which Christ enters in the liturgy because there is no time. That's the first thing. But it's important even for us to understand that when you enter, you're coming out cold from the world. When you enter into church, you have your problems. Maybe you're fighting with your wife or your husband. You don't know how you're going to pay the bills. You have a big test. Your boss is driving you crazy. And you walk in. And you're unable to discern the presence of God. You see in verse 21, what does it say? We were hoping, we were hoping that it was He who was going to redeem Israel. These disciples are on the road leaving Jerusalem after Christ was crucified. They're leaving, they're going away. Unable to discern that the person that is walking with them is Christ himself. And that is exactly what happens that they could not discover. Was Christ with them? Yes. But their eyes were not opened. Christ had not yet been revealed to them. They were saying, we were hoping that Christ 
was going to hear us. We thought he was going to save us. We thought he was going to take away our problems. We thought he was going to make us rule with him. We thought we were going to be like part of his big kingdom. And then he let us down. So as they're going, you find that in the liturgy, people are entering into the church, entering with all their problems, with all their weakness, all their sins, all their guilt, the distraction of their life. And this is exactly what the disciples are doing as they're entering into Christ's presence. They're discouraged. They're saying, we thought he was going to do this, and we thought God was going to be powerful in my life. I thought God was going to give me power of my sin. I thought, I thought, I thought. And we're unable to discover the presence of God. Why not? Why is it so hard for us to discover God's presence in our midst, even from the beginning of the liturgy? You're going to see there's different people in the story that are described or talked about, and each one is talking about their experience with God in a different way. So you have the two disciples of Emmaus. They're walking with Christ, and it says in verse 16, their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. But what did they say in verse 22? When they were describing other people, they said what? Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. How many of you have ever entered into a liturgy and you look at the guy next to you, he's like smiling and he's like in the third heaven and you don't get it. What is it that he is like? Sometimes... If you've ever prayed with, there's certain very holy priests that when they pray the liturgy, we recently, a few months ago, had a a visiting priest who, he starts praying the Thanksgiving prayer, and he starts choking up, he's crying. Vuna, what are you crying about? I pray this every day, seven times a day, and I never cry. I don't understand what you're crying. But it is that he has entered and he's been able to discern the presence of God. My wife comes from, from another state, and she, she, attend, she grew up at a church where the priest, the liturgy was so long because half the liturgy, he's just, he's pausing, and he's crying, and the deacons are like, just finish. The deacons have no idea what it is that the priest himself is discerning, that his eyes are opened, just like these women. They went to the tomb, and they saw visions of angels. And here they are walking with Christ himself, and they could not discern. What is it? Pay attention to the details of the story. It says in verse 22, And certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early. They arrived at the tomb early. They astonished us. Anyone who comes to liturgy early for probably more than half of the year, and attends the Matins prayer, Amber Rafael always says that even from the opening of the curtain, there is a special blessing for those people. The opening of the curtain from Elay Suni or have mercy on us, O God, the Father, and beginning the prayer, there is a special grace that is bestowed upon those people. The people that come early and hear the Matins gospel. What is the gospel that is read for people that attend liturgies regularly and they come in the beginning. In matins, probably three-fourths of the year. What is it? Who knows? Going to the tomb and the resurrection. And it was is that because these women went early to the tomb, that because they went early, they saw the vision of angels. Even St. Peter and St. John, when they went later, what did they see? Empty tomb, some cloths. Of course, they could understand that something had happened, that Christ had risen, and they were still a little bit confused, because if they really understood, they probably would have went back fishing. But the women that went early, they saw visions of angels. It is important, it is important for us to go from the beginning of the liturgy to be able, I'm going to explain why, because what takes place in the liturgy is a special grace working in you from the very beginning. 
There is something working in your heart, in your life, in your eyes that you cannot understand or comprehend. What happens when Christ begins to walk with them? From verse 25 to 27. It says, Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Here Christ begins to preach to them. And this is the beginning of the revelation. You know, for one to be able to discern the presence of God, it has to come by revelation. It can't come by the mind. Sometimes when you have converts enter the church, recently I was sitting with somebody who's trying to understand, and she doesn't come from a, a, an orthodox background, she doesn't understand the concept of the Eucharist. And as I'm trying to explain, there's only so much you can explain. It comes by revelation. That even when Christ, he says, who do people say that I am? He said, some people say you're Elijah, John the Baptist. Some people say Jeremiah. He says, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And what does Christ tell Peter? Who remembers? Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. The discerning of God's presence is a mystery. It has to come by revelation. So when you are coming to church and you left and you're wondering, why is the Buddha taking so long? And why is the Buddha got to say that extra part? And why are the deacons wanting this, to sing this extra hymn? Because the discerning of God's presence only comes by revelation. So one is preparing himself that God would reveal himself. First, we have the preaching of Christ in this passage are the readings that we have. And Christ, little by little, is beginning to explain to them and try to reveal himself to them through his words. And whoever doesn't come in the beginning of the liturgy won't see that. Which is why the church always says that you have to come by the readings in order to what? Take communion. Why? Because there's no way, there's no way you will be able to discern the presence of God unless by the word of God, unless through the readings, because he's beginning to present himself. And that's what happens. And beginning, verse 27, at Moses and all the prophets. So what is Moses? What, what part of the Bible? What is Moses? When he's saying beginning at Moses. It's not just the life of Moses, but who wrote the first five books? The first five books were called the books of Moses. So even starting from the very beginning, the whole purpose of Scripture is to reveal Christ. And you find him from the first pages of Scripture. And that was the purpose. Christ took Scripture and he's beginning slowly to uncover and open their minds and their hearts. You cannot take communion. We're not strict at this church. And we try, have a respectful relationship with the members of the church. We're, we're taibin. And you should appreciate that because there's some tough priests out there. You should not be partaking. Because there is no way you will discern the body of the Lord without attending the reading without himself presenting, without Christ himself teaching us through his words. The liturgy of the word is to prepare you and it's supposed to bring you to him and it's supposed to help you open your eyes. It's always understood that the liturgy is broken up into two halves. The liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the the faithful or the believers. Very good. The first half is called the engagement. The second half is the, the wedding. And it is the marriage. And in, in engagement, does anybody fully know their spouse? 
Men don't answer that too quickly. Does any men, does anybody fully know their spouse during engagement? Do you know her that well? The Bible tries to tell us that when man knew his wife, he knew her, of course, intimately, in, in the intimacy or the privacy of the bedroom, he knew her when he became married. And so you cannot fully be able to discern God's presence until you go through this engagement period and you begin just little by little to open your eyes. This path or this road that Christ is walking with the disciples on is the liturgy of the Word. He's going and He's revealing Himself and He's speaking. Even though when you attend the first half of the the liturgy, you don't discern His presence because the physical body isn't transformed yet. So you're not able to discover His presence. What do we say when we read the gospel? The, the priest says before, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. Right? Before that it says, who said to the saintly prophets, many prophets and righteous men have desired to see the things which you see and have not seen them. The prophets, that even when the prophets were talking about the incarnation of Christ, they didn't get it. They still couldn't d- understand what, what do you mean God is going to become man and take our flesh and be born. They didn't get it. And it's the same thing in the liturgy. These disciples, what's happening is it's a preparation of your heart. Ready to be in the presence of his body. You can't just come in cold, partake of the, commu- of, of the Eucharist because you walked in, you know, halfway through the liturgy and expect that you've come in the same reverence or understanding of who he is. So we say in the beginning of the Bible, stand in the fear of God, and as the deacon is reading, Abuna is offering incense, and we have the two deacons standing on each side holding the candles representing what? The angels. Representing the angels around him with candles. He leaves the altar. Abuna leaves the altar, and what? Offers incense to what? So in the beginning, the liturgy of the word is your first communion. It's your first communion. You partake of communion twice. You partake from the word of God, and then you partake from the word of God, the logos of God. You cannot come one without the other. It's extremely important. And then... And then we have to understand, in verse 32, do you guys know how long this journey was that they walked for? How long do you think this path took them? Take a stab at it. It was a six-hour walk. Imagine they were walking with Christ for six hours, for six hours, and they could not discern his presence. When was it that they discerned him? You'll see right now. In verse 32, what does Christ say? Actually, let's go back to 25. He says, then he said to them, O foolish ones. Why is Christ saying, O foolish ones? Like, take it easy. Like, we don't understand. We don't know. Why are you being so tough? When he says, O foolish ones, and then he's trying to say, he's trying to give them this sense of, unawareness. Prepare yourself. Open your eyes. And he says, you are slow of heart. Who is he comparing them to? The women who went early were able to see the vision of the angels. They understood that Christ resurrected. Even Mary Magdalene saw Christ himself. But the person that is coming with all their problems, he's saying, you're slow of heart. You're unable to realize that I am here, and I'm here from the very beginning. And I'm coming to give you and to exchange life with you. And I'm going to explain what that means. He's saying if you've attended God's love and his message to you in the word, what's taking you so long to understand? Some people already saw it talking about the women, talking about the people who have come here with the right heart. Then, 
This, uh, a couple days ago, I was at an Orthodox convent, and I took a retreat there. And they were telling me that they don't pray liturgies in the middle of the week, but they offered something called the pre-sanctified gifts. And this was a practice that came in the early church in which they would pray the liturgy on Sunday, and two urbanas would be present at the liturgy, and they would be pre-sanctified, and then they would be distributed in the liturgies in the middle of the week, especially in Lent, for one reason. Because in Lent, because in the liturgy, it is the act of resurrection. Each and every one of us is resurrecting with Christ. And so because they didn't want to practice liturgy because they didn't want to celebrate the resurrection in Lent, they would just offer the pre-sanctified gifts without practicing liturgy. Because when you enter into liturgy, you are coming to die and what? To resurrect. You are not just offering with Abuna bread and wine, flesh and blood of Christ. You're offering your own flesh and blood. You're offering your own flesh and blood. Your flesh is symbolizing your life. You're coming in, you're offering my life. And I'm saying, Lord, I want to give my life to you. And every time you enter into liturgy, you are re-consecrating your life to him. You're saying, Lord, I am all yours. My thoughts, my time, my friendships, my relationships, my money, every ounce of breath that I have in my life, I'm coming and I'm bringing my flesh. And I'm also offering my blood. And blood is offering my death. My death to myself. When you come into the liturgy and you enter to meet Christ in the Eucharist, you're saying, Lord, grant that I may be offered on this altar. That I myself would be also the sacrifice. That I'm offering every part of my life. Which is why people, they come in, they go out, they have no idea what they did because they didn't come with an offering. The liturgy is an offering and an exchange. Christ offered himself for our sake. And what was, re- what was given in return? The Father gave us what? Salvation. The Father gave us salvation because he wasn't just going to take the sacrifice and that's it. No. You know that they used to, when they had took, partook of the Passover, they'd offer the Passover and then they'd do what with the Passover? They would, they would eat it. And so he's saying that it's a two-way thing. You are... You are Celebrating this two-way exchange of the sacrifice. What you find in the liturgy, repeated over and over again, is that Christ, he came, he suffered, he died, he arose. We start out from reconciliation prayer. We say, O God, the great who, was, who formed man in incorruption and death which entered into the world, and the life-giving manifestation of Christ, Okay? life giving manifestation of your only begotten Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, and then we say, uh, we say glory to God in the highest. And then after, we talk about later on was incarnate, became man. He descended into Hades through the cross. And we talk about the resurrection. Later on at the end of the liturgy, in the confession, Abuna says, Amen, Amen, Amen. I believe, I believe, I believe. And confess to the last breath. That this is life giving flesh of your only begotten Son. Took from Our Lady, talking about the incarnation. He made it one of his divinity. He um, offered himself on the wood of the cross for his own will for us all, given for us for salvation, redemption of sins or salvation, forgiveness of sins. What is Abuna saying? All our focus in this liturgy is the life of redemption and salvation. I'm coming to be redeemed and to be saved. I'm coming to be redeemed and to be saved, to die with Christ into resurrection. So when you come, you should be leaving with an act of resurrection. You have resurrected with Christ. Something me and Abuna just discovered right now in the translation of, of the liturgy, which is a little bit wrong, should be corrected. At the end, right before the, 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 the fraction, Abuna says, let us also ask him to make us worthy of the communion and partaking of his divine and immortal sacraments. In Arabic, it's, it's what? Asaad. Or another part, Asad Gesed. But it's not just the partaking this. It's actually, the Coptic word is Nemtimet Alemepsis. Who knows, who knows the, if you know the Coptic hymns of the, 
we say, Christos Anisti, we sing that hymn. And then after the ascension, what do we say? Christos Analemipsis. So when we take, we ourselves are ascended to heaven. The word is Analemipsis, meaning you are ascending to heaven with Christ because you are knighted to Christ. You've become one with Christ. It says, He sat us with Him in the heavenly places. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, I believe it is. He sat us with Himself and enthroned us with Him in the heavenly places. So when you partake, you have to understand that you have been carried with Christ and you are sitting with God the Father at His right hand. And then, all that we're doing, who is it for? Who is all this sacrifice being offered for? Who do you think? Who is this, all this sacrifice that's being offered, who is it for? Huh? Huh? Who? For us. It's actually to the Father. When Christ was offered, it was for who? The, the, the acceptable sacrifice was offered. Why were sacrifices offered in the Old Testament? They were given to God. They were offered to God. And in return for that, they were given something else. So when the deacon comes and he says, offer, offer, offer an order. Stand with trembling. Because now come closer to God. He is in our midst. You have to discern his presence. And you are coming now because... There's going to be an exchange of life. You are coming to say, Lord, my problems, my distractions, my emptiness, all of this, and now I want to be Christ's. I want Christ's life. I want to feel the power of his resurrection over my sins. I want to feel that I'm living with God himself at all times. And then, when you enter into church, you go in man, you exit what? Christ. You exit Christ. You're saying, what does that mean? What do you mean I'm Christ? Christ's body has dissolved in you. His blood is going through you, has gone to your brains. That when you're leaving, you're not leaving as man. You're leaving as Christ into the world in order to present Christ into the world. Which is why Christ could say, I am the light of the world. And later on he says what? You are the light of the world. How is that? doesn't match. doesn't make sense. That's exactly the message, is that you are entering man, you are leaving Christ. You're entering sinners, you are exiting sanctified and saints. You go in as individuals, you come out what? Every single person is coming here alone. One thing you have to discern that happens in liturgy, you're leaving as one body. All of us are connected through the body of Christ that was planted in each and every one of us, so we've all become the body of Christ, which is why there's no way you can partake if you have any hard feelings towards anyone in your heart. How many of you have taken communion several times, mad at your mother-in-law or mad at whoever because they're driving you bonkers? And you leave and you're holding a grudge? That is the biggest sin against the flesh and the blood of our Lord, believe it or not. Two things are usually announced by priests when they, before they give communion. You must, be conf you must be baptized and confessing regularly in the Orthodox Church and you must not have any hard feelings towards anyone in your hearts. Because there's no way we could be united and become one in Christ and we hate each other outside as we leave. There's no way. So when you come into church, you're coming to say, I'm leaving my old self, the hatred, the drama, the tension. I'm leaving and I'm leaving a new person. Imagine if everybody practiced liturgy in that way, the love that would be shown in the church. Who's offering the sacrifice? Who's offering the sacrifice? So he said, the sacrifice is offered to the son. And then, who's offering the sacrifice? Huh? Say it loud. Abuna. Abuna is just as much a sinner as you guys. Who makes Abuna? How is Abuna able to offer the sacrifice? It is not Abuna. When you kiss Abuna's hand, you are not kissing Father Paul's hand or Father Bishoy or Father Dumerius or Father Anthony. You are kissing Christ himself's hand. Believe me, if you are hoping that any of us are offering that sacrifice, <laughs> that it's not happening. You believe in the wrong thing. 
what's, what we believe in the sacraments of the church is that it's a mystery. It's a mystery. And that Christ himself is offering through Abuna. That when you, Abuna is standing there, it is Christ offering himself to the Father. Because that's the only way it would be accepted. Sinners cannot offer. It wouldn't be acceptable. It is, has to be coming from Christ himself working through the priesthood mysteriously. And that's the mystery. What do we say? This is he who offered himself as an acceptable sacrifice on the cross. Thanks for the, for the you know, boost of confidence, but it really has nothing to do with us. We are standing in there, and Christ mysteriously is using us. And he is the one that's offering. So when you see Abuna, and Abuna is singing, who's standing and singing? It's Christ. And when Abuna turns around and says, peace be with you all, who's saying peace be with you all? Christ. Amazing. And when, when Abuna is saying, lift up your hearts, who's saying lift up your hearts? Don't lie to him and say, they are with the Lord and they're with your checkbook or they're with the sale that's after. They are with the Lord, meaning I'm telling Christ, I'm going to prepare my heart, I'm going to clean it and send the Holy Spirit to take it up with you. That's what we have to believe. that We are united in him. And it's offered for man to God. And then verse 29, we're in Luke chapter 24, verse 29. Verse 20, it says, Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. So they're... When they discerned his presence, they constrained him. They said, stay with us. Abide with us. And then it says, from 30 to 31, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. So the first part, when he's teaching them about the prophets, that's the liturgy of the word. When the body becomes sanctified in the liturgy of the faithful, it is then when his body is there in our midst, that we could discern his presence. And when you discern his presence, you do like Jacob. You cling to him. And you said, abide with me. Don't let me and you become separate at any point. Let us become one. Abide with me. And then, why does he vanish from their sight? Why does he vanish from their sight? Where is he? He broke bread and gave it to them. So where is he? He's in them. The fathers of the church talk, they, they say two things. Some fathers say that this was the actual practice of the Eucharist. And some people say this is a symbol of what was going to take place in the Eucharist. Saying that as soon as they partake, he vanishes. Why? Because he is in you. So the beginning of the liturgy is to prepare you to move your heart. Which is why it says in verse 32, And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road? Burn within us means what? If your heart is burning in you, what is it doing to you? It should be convicting you to repentance. It says once we heard the word of God, and we heard the readings, and we saw maybe if the, if the gospel is about the second coming, we're talking about Christ as shepherd and how he lays his life down for the sheep and he takes it up again. That message should convict us to repentance. So if you don't come from the beginning, you're not coming with the spirit of repentance. You're not coming with this conviction that God is in our midst. Now, if you understood the first half as a preparation to get a revelation, it would be that you'd never want Abuna to end. If you're coming for this exchange of life and you're saying, Abuna, I want to be prepared. You're saying, Jesus, I want to be prepared. More readings, more hymns. I need more time to be prepared mentally and spiritually and physically to be able to repent so that what? I could partake of the most holy sacrifice. The person that's thinking, that's thinking Yalla, Abuna, finish, is the person that has not repented. Sorry. I know we all have things that have to happen, but the person that is in a rush is the person that didn't come for the exchange of life. 
came for morning breakfast, drive through get the show on the road, I'm hungry. We need to change. We need to make ourselves one with the words so that when we hear and we prepare, it's there to be given, to open our eyes so that when he offers himself, I can see and I'm ready to repent. So they rose up that very hour in verse 33 and returned to Jerusalem. So after they partake, what happens? And found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together. They became one after partaking, saying, The Lord is risen indeed. Do you see the tone that's taken place? Do you see the exchange of life? Christ says, Why are you guys so sad? And they're saying, Don't you know what happened? The Christ that we were following didn't meet our expectations. After they partook of the Eucharist, what's the tone that they're saying? The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. All of a sudden you see resurrection. In the liturgy, you should come. You should die with Christ and you will resurrect with Christ. You are resurrecting in this. And that's why when you leave, you should be like floating. I remember I met a hermit in Egypt. I served with him for some time in, in Africa. And he serves in a cave. He says from his cave to the cave that he would pray in, it's a 45-minute walk to climb. And he would pray a liturgy in that cave. And he says... And after I would take communion, it would take me like five minutes to get back. Of course, we, could, we understood what he was saying, but he was like moved from the church to his cave again in an instant. Why? Because now he's leaving this resurrection. He said it would take me five minutes to get back. In the sense where he could experience the joy of the resurrection. He was a, he's an anchorite. He could just... Go or be there, whatever it, whatever it was. And then what happens at the end? And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Can you honestly tell me that you believe you've partaken of Christ's body and his blood and his salvation and you leave this place and you haven't told anyone about his, the message of salvation? You've received salvation. If you believe that you've received and you've partaken and you've been united to Christ and you leave and all you're worried about is the Super Bowl game or the NFL games or the basketball games. It says they went and they told people about the things. And in verse 36, now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you all. At the end of the liturgy, you partake. Abuna says what? And it should be the whole hymn. O King of peace, grant us your peace, render unto us your peace and forgive us our sins. And then it goes all the way down to Emmanuel, our God, is now in our midst with the glory of his Father and the Holy Spirit. Then what does he say? Go in peace. Emmanuel is in our midst. He's with us. Go in peace. He's sending you with the peace of God in you. That is the liturgy. It is that we would practice this. We come in with our problems, maybe unable to discover God in order that we would become one with him, leaving with the joy of the resurrection and the power to share the word of salvation, leaving with peace. I pray that we would have this experience in the liturgy of, of a transfer of life. No matter how you come in, you leave a different person. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Good morning. What's wrong with you guys? Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> we learned before that, you know, it's always morning with the, with the people of God. Anyways, um, um, we're not going to take much longer. We're going to let you go soon. Um, just a few words, kida, and then we'll take some questions. If you have any questions, write it down. If you want to leave early, then don't try it down any questions, and we'll leave early. So, um, or you can just, uh, you know, stand and say questions when, when we're done. I have a question for you first, okay? How did people learn about liturgy before when they didn't have the books we have and the internet and these explanations and all these books? How did they learn about the liturgy? Uh, I can take different answers. It's not just one answer. How did they learn? 
like we we you know we're talking about how they they did it and how did they do it how did they understand they had 10% of the knowledge we have mm. what do you think the a the disciples their disciples oh they were disciples yani oh so, so people taught each other yani Okay. Yani through sermons, like what we're doing, I, yani I have a different opinion. Huh. Sorry? The fathers learned from people. Okay. I'm actually going to get to this. One of the things they learned is through seeing others, not listening to others. You know, it's good that you listen to what we're saying. But it's better to, you know, watch people who are really uh, praying and who are really, you know, in, in heaven. So seeing other people. That's why it's, it's, a, it's contagious when, when there is a group of people who, who are experiencing God and experiencing the liturgy, they become contagious and other people learn from them. You know, when you come to the liturgy, most likely you're not going to be affected much by what you hear, but mainly by what you see, you know? It's good to, to learn about reverence, but it's a completely different thing when you see someone who is standing in reverence, okay? So through others or uh, 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 seeing others. What else? No? From the Bible, okay? Mm. Don't be shy. Mom and dad, my yani experience of others, as we said. Huh? Holy Spirit, you're getting there. I think it's just a... a sorry? Huh? Quiet time? Okay. Or the Holy Spirit, the, the same. I think it's just experience through just doing it over and over and over and over, okay? Uh, the best way to learn, we can talk about the Bible forever, but the best way to understand the Bible, just open the Bible and read, and read a lot, just doing it a lot, you know, through, you know, experience, seeing others, but through your own experience also. And, and when you're, you're in the presence of God during the liturgy, as, as Iman said, that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and will remind you with everything I said to you. Without knowing the deep teaching, the Holy Spirit can, 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 ev can even give it to you. I'm not saying it's not good to study. It's very important to study. But uh, it will be uh, no good if we study without the experience. Experiencing meaning a lot, attending as, as, as many liturgies as possible. When it becomes the core uh, of our worship. So there is no liturgy in that church and I, I have time and I'm not there. Like, does, it's not in a dictionary. One other thing is also we complain about being distracted in the liturgy a lot. Being distracted in the liturgy means my, pers my, my relationship with God is, is a little bit shaky. Means my, my prayer life at home is, is distracted a little bit. It's the reflection of my personal life. If you want to experience the best liturgy is when you have your personal prayer and your connection with God is, 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 you know, I'm not solving the problem of personal distraction now, but I'm telling you why you have distractions in the liturgy. It's not because of the liturgy. It's because you personally, when you stand at home, you're distracted. That's a completely different topic. We can uh, say it uh, some other time. So it's, uh, it's experience and learning from the experience of others and it's contagious. Also, if you're not participating, it's completely different. Meaning participating, meaning you know every hymn that is said and why it's said, and you know how to say it. Make, makes the biggest difference ever. So how can I learn? Just learn. Get books, if, if you care, you, you're, you're gonna learn. The more you learn, the more you discover, and the more you taste. And it's so sweet, and it's so beautiful, you know? 
But if you're still a spectator and they keep saying stuff here that you don't understand, you're missing out on a lot. I know maybe you know, you've know never learned that and you think it's too late, it's never, it's never too late. Um, I have seen a lot, so many people who are like uh, in, in the retirement and they start to come to church and you know, dress deacons because you know, they were busy all their lives. Guess what they do? They learn. It's very hard and they're off tone and you know, but they're blessed people. They're the best people in the world, you know. So participating. Maybe reading the readings before you come to, to church if you have the chance. If you have the chance to do that, completely different experience. And getting the theme of the readings, as we've said before. Uh, how do I know if I'm growing in, 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 in understanding the liturgy and participating in the liturgy? How do I know? How do I measure it? What's the measure? Is the measure how early I come? or the measure how much I know, what's the measure? Huh? If you come early, okay. Huh? Both. Huh? Fruit in your life. It's good, but you know, it's something that's very relative. <laughs> huh? How do I know in the liturgy that I'm getting better? Yeah. Huh? The sense of peace inside your heart. You're getting there. Huh? When you, feel, when you feel it short, definitely. Yes, give him a hand. <laughs> That's pathetic. It's okay. I mean, your, your clap is pathetic. The man said something very nice. You should have clapped better for him. I said, clap for him, please. Yes, thank you. When you feel it short, yes. When I feel I'm what? I'm in heaven. You're 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 getting almost there. Huh? When you enjoy it. Uh, huh? Michael. That's too romantic. Huh? <laughs> huh? Yes. When you're you're looking forward to the next liturgy, okay? Huh? What? When you feel whole. Full? Whole? <laughs> My English is so bad. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think there is... Okay. Uh, one of the main measurements is how much... Um, it's the experience of Isaiah when he saw God. The reverence that you have. You know, the reverence means there is more revelation. When God opened Isaiah's eyes in Isaiah 6 and he saw the glory of God, he was full of reverence. He was full of repentance. He was full of tears. It's like the more reverence, the more I'm aware where I am. Okay? Could be joy, could be repentance, could be tears, many ways of expression of the reverence of God and, and, and his presence uh, during the liturgy. Um, the biggest fight you have in the liturgy is distractions. Who's walking and what they're dressing and what they're saying and all of this. I don't have a solution for you other than standing as to the front as possible and you know, closing your eyes as much as you can. If your only liturgy is Sunday, then you know, forget about the series and everything we said because it's useless. Because you know, especially if you're a servant, you go and you have your kids, your family, stuff like this. And Sunday is like what you what you have to do, but the weekdays is what you want to do. Okay, so experiencing weekdays, like I tell people, especially parents. Go Sunday for their kids, your kids and teach them and, you know, be with them. But go to a week liturgy and just, you know, just to, to enjoy. I enjoy Sunday, but, you know, guess I'm, I'm sitting in a nice place and I don't feel the distractions. And fight judging others. One judgment come out of your heart, you're going to lose the reverence of God. Just one judgment. They're saying, they're dressing, they're loud, they're this, they're that. Okay? 
So it, it, uh, it, it, it deplete the Holy Spirit and his work in our heart. It's good to pray with, with, with our kids, children or Sunday school kids. I don't know what happened, I, but we used to do that a lot. Like, like I was a deacon and always had the kids with me. I don't know where we learned that from, maybe from our, you know, um, uh, uh, Sunday school servants, but that's what we learned. You're a servant, you're, you, you never, you're never praying by yourself. Um, I don't know, is this a foreign thing? Is this something possible? Is it like not practical? Can we check they're coming, they're not coming, especially from a deacon, they're with me or, you know, they're with their parents, I'm just gonna be standing in that corner and so you know the third graders they're you know they're there and they like to stand together and they say the hymns together i don't know if this is something theoretical or what but this is something we did and it was very very good and that's how we passed on what we learned to others so that's that's what i have to say any questions now it's all yours can i count to one if the cook <laughs> okay <laughs> Yes, Mary. But Sana, let me get you a mic because I, I have a hearing problem. Let's try. Different liturgies. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, we have, there are a lot of liturgies, but there are three common that we use at a church. Is the most common is St. Basil. And St. Basil liturgy is offered to the Father, to God the Father. The prayer all, you know. So when we talk about the Lord Jesus, we talk about him as a, as a, as a, as a, um, a, a third uh, uh, party, okay? So we say, um, we ask and entreat your goodness, O uh, uh, lover of mankind, or the Father of our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's St. Basil, and that's the, the most common. The second most common is the Gregorian. And um, Gregor the Gregorian liturgy is, is, is mainly prayed to the Lord Jesus Christ, or the Son. And, and usually it's prayed in the, in the, in the Lord's feasts. Yani, uh, um, we usually use it in, in feasts because the feasts are for the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It's beautiful, it's, uh, you know, celebrative. So mainly feasts. Um, St. Cyril is, is, is the third and used to be the most common. It's actually, St. Cyril actually adapted it, but it's originally St. Mark's liturgy. So it's the liturgy that, that St. Mark uh, um, did and um, and St. Cyril adapted it. That's why it's, it's called St. Cyril. It's pray to the Father also. Uh, so St. Basil to the Father, St. Gregory to the Son, St. Cyril to, to the Father. It's a little bit longer. Um, and there are two ways of doing it, or there is the right way or the wrong way. Uh, when Abuna Dumadius is praying it, it's usually the right way. When you know I'm doing it, it's the wrong way. It's... Um, <laughs> The liturgy is like so long, so they adapted a little bit. And, uh, you know, some of the priests prayed it in, in that way to match St. Saint, Saint Basil. So we imitate that. And also because it's shorter. Um, and usually it's prayed during Lent because it's a, it's a, it has a lot of supplications and it's a... Um, Supplicative. That's Abuna, Abuna's word if it's wrong. <laughs> My English is good. <laughs> yes. Last time if you had to get an amen. Wait, Amen. I'm sorry, I mean, the water at the end, what the does it represent? Like when Abuna, the water in the end? Life, yeah. And you can leave now. Because <laughs> people won't leave. <laughs> I think 
the only thing just did we just spray them with water now. Um, uh, what I know is a meditation. I'm going to tell you what I know, and then I'm going to give the mic to the fathers. Um, there's a lot of things we do in the liturgy that يعني, we don't know the exact uh, meaning of that. But the, the, the water, suppose, يعني, supposedly, when I sprinkle you, I, I just don't throw it in your face, OK? The, you know, the right way is just to throw it, and it, it comes down on you like a rain. So it's a representation of, of the Holy Spirit. You know that we're we're filled with the Holy Spirit, but this is I, I feel this is more like a like a meditation. That's what I heard. Yeah, I heard that in in in, in the book of um, Saint John the First Epistle, he said about the Lord Jesus Christ, He is the one who comes with water and blood. But after receiving the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we receive the water. And that also represents what um, <clears throat> in the Old Testament, when they were, for someone who uh, is suffer was suffering from leprosy or, or committed sin, he spent some time uh, unholy. And he needed a special prayer to be holy. <clears throat> and that was representing the resurrection and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. They brought a bird to bear this one to kill and the other to immerse in, in, in a water with the blood of the killed bird. And then they sprinkle that water and that's the way to be clean. For after receiving the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the priest sprang the water to reveal that we, now we are clean through receiving the holy blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's my... Very similar to what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question. Again. Mary, uh, uh, okay, sure. Okay, I have a question about the um, putting the names on the altar. Is there the what? I've put when people put names, names when on you the pray altar? for someone to put their names on the altar? Number one, is there a particular time at which, like? I think you're supposed to do that before the gospel is read or something. And second of all, what happens every week with all of those names? Do we keep those somewhere? <laughs> I know it's a weird question. I'm just wondering. Yeah, we keep them in the trash. Uh, <laughs> afterwards, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> um, usually, or the right way, if these requests of prayer, they come before raising the lamb. So that's when we mention them during raising uh, the lamb and, and, and throughout the prayers. And the, the deceased, we, we, we pray for them or we mention them during, after the commemoration of saints. So if you're asking about the right time, they should come. It's just the right time or do you have another question? The right time. Yeah, it's before raising the lamb. So, you know, we mention these prayers. If you had upstairs. Uh, Traditionally, there's altars, and especially there's, there is an altar over there, and traditionally there's usually altars behind every curtain. And so the only people that can enter the altar, it's not just, you know, people think that men are allowed to go. It's not men. It's people that are consecrated to the altar that are allowed to enter. And so... The purpose of liturgy is that we are worshiping as the faithful. There's nothing, there's nothing sinful about entering, but the people that are entering the altar, that's why we allow deacons, and deacon, the word deacon is relative. Before, they used to be wholly consecrated to the church, and those are the only ones that could enter. It's not men and not women. No, it's neither men nor women. It's people that are consecrated to the altar. When I said something, I said, people ask, you know, why women are not allowed in the altar. It's not women or men. It's only يعني, deacons and used to be even consecrated deacons. يعني, the altar used to be a very reverent place. يعني, not just anyone can enter. Mark. Bruno, I have, I have a multi-part question. Uh, uh -oh. The first is, I heard that the first liturgy was written by St. Mark. The first? Liturgy. Uh, first liturgy ever? Yeah, in the oh, Coptic, okay. in the church. So, 
when... I haven't finished the question yet, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is the one who started and established the liturgy for us. And we are now practicing the, the liturgy of the Lord Jesus Christ. But historically, the first one who started to pray the liturgy after the Lord Jesus Christ, he was St. James, St. Jacob, the Bishop of, of Jerusalem. And from St. James, uh, all the liturgies all over the world was uh, descended, especially the liturgy of St. Mark in Egypt. So in, in our church, who canonized the, the liturgies or the services that we have? And the hymns too. Just before um, the Nicene uh, Council, it was allowed to any bishop to pray just the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ and to choose for himself what he wants to pray. But, but after the uh, Nicene Council, the, um, the, the, the church all over the world, they, especially in the Coptic Church, they chose just three documented or three approved liturgies and many other liturgies. And I think the Ethiopian church received from us extra 14 liturgies from our church. We have many liturgies just before um, the, the, the Nicene Council. But after Nicene Council, they accepted only uh, the, uh, the liturgies of the Orthodox Fathers. And I mean Orthodox needs our church, but not a reusian. That's what the... Uh, um, my other question, and I'll try to make these into one, is, is the liturgy that we come to, is it for, for prayer, or can you also have specific prayer requests? What is more appropriate? Is it to come and be and enjoy the presence of God, or is it okay to also come with specific requests. And then I'll ask this. The other one is, can, you, can the priest ever tell someone or can someone who feels undeserving of, of communion, can they still come to liturgy? Or is it, is it okay to feel undeserving and not come? About the feeling okay and undeserving, I was reading something from St. John Chrysostom who was saying that no one is ever deserving. Like, no one is more deserving than the other. But the key is that we come all with the spirit of repentance. Not because I prayed all the Agbeya hours last night. I'm better off than the guy that didn't pray. That I'm more deserving. No one is deserving. St. John Chrysostom says, I pray that no one approaches or, or doesn't approach because they're undeserving. Because none of us are deserving. It's number one. But we should always come with a spirit of repentance. And, and you are given absolutions in the liturgy. Abuna is praying the absolution several times. And then the second question was, quickly. One word. What is it? Oh, yeah. You can come in with your personal prayers. There's times where you should have your personal prayers, which is why after the body is consecrated, we have all the litanies. Now that Christ is in our midst, pray for the peace, pray for the pope, pray for the priests, pray for... All these things, we pray for the, the waters of the rivers. We pray for everything. In that time, lift up your personal prayers. And, and this is the time where in the presence of Christ, we come here with our personal prayers and also never forgetting the, the, the litanies that are offered. Good question. Well, there's many saints that we don't say. So Ambrose is not just, he's not the only one that we left out. Hopefully he's not upset at us. But I think there's, if you attend the commemoration of saints during Tazbeha, there's hundreds and hundreds of saints in there. We just go through the, the ones that are, are, are clearly canonized and ones that represent fathers of the church, ones that represent patriarchs, evangelists, confessors, and so on. Okay, Abuna. I, I just want to clarify something between commemoration of the saints during the tazbih and during the liturgy. You will find in the commemoration of the saints during the liturgy, there is no women. There is no uh, martyrs. Because the church wants, especially during the liturgy, to focus on the fathers of the church who had the right faith. You will find many of the of the fathers and the saints of the church uh, out 
the commemoration of saints. That's for Abu Nabur. The people who passed away without any. <coughs> Many times I receive papers on the altar, just Lord remember, and they mention the, the names. I don't know if that is sick and need to heal, or that is. <laughs> I said, Lord, please, you can remember the according to your grace. <laughs> One thing I read in a, in a book about why we pray for the departed is because in liturgy, we believe that we are outside of time, right? And so if you're outside of time and you're talking about somebody who died in time, it's as though we are saying we are praying for the departed outside of the realm of time that God would have mercy on their soul. Because when we believe that we're outside of time, it's as though we could be praying before they died. I heard this, I read this in, a, in, an, or, in an Orthodox book explaining liturgy. It was talking about how that we believe in the, when we remember the departed in liturgy because we are outside of time, it's as though we are praying for them. It could be as though we're praying before them before they died. So we we're still asking for God to have mercy on their souls. Abuna, Abuna Bisho asked me to say that we believe that we have one church. We are one body. And the body of the Lord Jesus Christ in two forms, the visible and the invisible. And every liturgy, every liturgy, we are not only the, the attending of the liturgy. We are just the visible members. But every liturgy we have all the body of the Lord Jesus Christ is attending the liturgy. So the church focus every liturgy to remind us that many, many of the saints is attend, are attending the liturgy with us. We believe that there is no death in the church that is just a departure. And we and them, we are one in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Questions? Abuna? Sorry. I have a question about... Um, I visited uh, other Orthodox churches where they would fast, I think it was like two to three hours before communion. Um, why, why is it that we fast nine hours before communion? In the early church, I was reading something from St. Ambrose of Milan. He was talking, it's not just two or three hours that's wrong. They used to fast from the night before from Vespers, from sunset. And that was the beginning of the liturgical day. And then they would break the fast in the morning, in the morning liturgy. And so the purpose wasn't just two or three hours or nine hours. It used to be from the Ashaya before or the sunset before. And, that's, and I read that in St. Ambrose of Milan was writing something about that. Maybe some people say that the body prepares itself to receive in that nine hours. Could be true, could not be true, I don't know. <laughs> Anyone else? Abun, I also heard because Christ died at the ninth hour, the nine hours, uh, this is where we get the number nine from. Okay. Okay. Other questions? I think Mary wore out. <laughs> Sorry, Abuna, one more question. Um, how come during the week we don't use the symbols during the liturgy? There's, there's, no, there's no rule. There's no rule as to why we don't actually... In, in Lent? Is there a reason why we don't use the <laughs> From what I understand, actually, is that in the early church there was no even symbols. <laughs> there's meditations. We're sad, we're happy, we're depressed. It shouldn't be just by anachatadawa. It should be you, everyone should be coming to ask for absolution from the priest. And Abuna, when he gives absolution, it's not how Abuna is feeling that day. But Abuna, ideally, should if he's going to make an exception, it's an extreme exception because Abuna is is basically giving you permission outside the canons of the church 
So it, it's, it should be an extreme. So if it's medicine, not because you woke up with a headache, but you have to take some serious medicine, then go to your father confession, and he should give you, uh, he, uh, he might give you the absolution to, to partake. What if, what if you forget to ask? Forget to ask? Yes. And God is merciful, and so are the priests, but it's best not to forget, to, to follow by the rules of the church because the church places it on purpose. Question. What do we think about this at a Coptic Orthodox Church? If they take communion in churches outside of the Ori Oriental Orthodox families, they are taking into churches that they may not have said their creed and, and accept all of their teaching. <laughs> For example, if you partake in the Catholic Church, you are partaking and you are accepting all of their doctrines and their teachings, whatever they are, heresy, non-heresy, you're saying, I accept, give me the food. And so there's dangerous in partaking in another church in which you have not accepted their teaching or their doctrines. So we do it in, in any of our Orthodox Oriental families in which we've accepted all of their, 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 their dogmas and their doctrines. Anyone else? There's no more questions. Actually, I'm going to uh, and yani, comment on what Tony said about other Orthodox churches who are fasting three hours. What, what, what kind of Orthodox is this? Antiochian? Huh? La Syrian? There's no way. Um, what I want to tell you, the, the rules are dif different, but not majorly different between other Orthodox churches. I, I want to get rid of the mentality that we are better, okay? Because we're not. Even if we fast more than, yani I think we fast more than, you know, other churches. But it doesn't mean that we are better. And it doesn't mean that, you know, uh, who's correct and who's not correct. It's very important to get rid of this mentality because with this mentality, the churches will never be united, okay? So, um, and let's also know that a lot of things happen in, in the liturgy. Part of it is actually cultural, okay? Um, so we worship in certain music. Other churches worship in, in, in different other music. Um, uh, we worship in, in, in certain hours. We worship in, in, in other hours. Uh, we pray certain prayers, they don't pray, and vice versa. Most important is like not what you do, but how you do it, how you do it, and what's the condition of your heart, you know. We may fast more than other churches, but I knew some people from the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, when they fast, they are very surprised that we fast with oil. I said, like, like when you fast, you don't even, I said, no, no oil. What's the difference between oil and butter? There's just different kind of uh, um, fat. So we, we don't fast, you know, with oil. That's impossible. If you try to fast this way, if you know the people who fast St. Mary's this way, it's just, it's unbelievable. And they do it. Um, it doesn't mean they're better than us or we're better than them. It's just uh, a different way, and um, it's good never to have this spirit of, of, of judging others. And I'm not talk, talking about theology. You know, I'm not talking about theology that, you know, the Holy Spirit is descended from the Father and not for, from the Father and the Son. I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about the way, you know, we practice things. You know, don't... And even though you might attend liturgies in other churches, but you might not enjoy it. Because you're, you're not just used to it. You're not used to it. So don't say their liturgy is not as spiritual. No, it's just because you're not used to it. You know, it's like if you're used to, you know, Egyptian food and you eat American food and vice versa, you know, you're not gonna, it's not going to taste. But if you eat food every single day, 
you know, you're going to love it one day after a couple of years, you know, <laughs> it's going to happen. But, you know, just you, you like what you're used to, okay? So just, I wanted this to be clear. I don't like to have the spirit of judgment. It's not good. You know that the person who went to this is streamed. <laughs> I'll tell you this joke after they stop the streaming. Okay, let's let's stand up for prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love and for sending your only begotten Son to us to teach us and to to give us his grace and his wisdom. Thanks, Lord, for giving us every day to practice his incarnation, his death, and his resurrection. Thanks, Lord, for giving us your teaching through this series, asking, Lord, to support us and to continue to bless all your people. Please, Lord, forgive our sins and accept our prayer, our fasting, and through the prayer of Saint Mary and Saint Mark, and all your saints make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. And now may the love of God the Father, the grace of His only begotten Son, and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may depart in peace. May the peace of God be with you all. Just remember that this Sabbath.